Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that it's not just mushrooms on the posters of college students that glow under black lights. Uh, some mushrooms, like one called the flor de coco, which grow at the base of coconut trees in Brazil, glow at night to attract insects who spread their spores. It's kind of amazing what these interesting sorts of fungi can actually do. Today's guest uh, is, a, is a friend and a really amazing guy, a best-selling author of more than 10 books who just came out with a book called One Spirit Medicine. And he is a cultural anthropologist and a trained South American shaman whose name is Alberto Viotto. Alberto, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave. Good to be with you. If you haven't heard of Alberto's work, he is... I don't know that there's a word to describe what you do because you hang out with brain scientists like uh, Dr. Perlmutter and, and Dr. Hyman. And you actually wrote a book with Dr. Perlmutter at, at historically, at a book that I read. And you're the only shamanic practitioner I know who really gets into mitochondria and neurotransmitters. And you, you're like, look, there are these altered states, yeah, yeah. high performance states, and you can get into them. Um, Absolutely. Well, you know, shamans were the first neuroscientist, yeah. and actually my background is as a medical anthropologist, oh. so I, st I actually started out in a brain laboratory at San Francisco State University, and we were slicing and dicing the brain and looking for the mind, and that's when I closed my lab and packed up my bags and went to the Amazon to work with people that didn't have MRIs and microscopes, but could do extraordinary phenomena. I mean, they discovered curare, they discovered ayahuasca, and, um, and I wanted to study the mind. So that's the only place that you couldn't find it in the lab. And in fact, the reason that the shamans were so into the heightened states of consciousness, it's because those are the states where you could turn on your higher brain, your neocortex, your prefrontal cortex. Now, in your mid-20s, you were the youngest clinical professor at San Francisco State, and you literally started paying attention to things that maybe even now neuroscientists are just now getting, getting knowledge about. And that was what led you to go down this whole path. But you started out on, I would say, a more Western path than you ended up on. Or were you always kind of spiritually minded here? <laughs> you know, spirituality, I think, is the product of a healed brain, of a repaired brain. And we're living at a time when our brains are broken. Spirituality is about creativity, about seeing the oneness of our life, about recognizing that, that we are connected to our creation. And, uh, and I think that the people that are spiritual, not religious, but spiritual, really have, are the most successful people in the world because they're, they're not living in fight or flight. They're not running from danger or seeking safety all the time. They know that the game is big and they want to play it big. Now, I, I don't know if, if most people who are listening know this, but I, I've actually, the, the way I met you is I, I've, I've been trained by you. Like I, I took uh, the Four Winds Academy. Um, I took uh, a week of, of training and got your lectures from you every day. And, and that was how we got to know each other. Yeah. Um, I was a little disturbed when you sent me a copy of One Spirit Medicine, your new book, uh, because you sort of disclosed that, that you were having some really substantial health challenges um, at the beginning of the book. I'm like, wow, like I, I hope he's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But as yeah. I read... As I read through the book, I'm like, he's better than okay. Like you, you took some, I would say some potentially lethal things that were going on and completely reversed them, not using just a, a spiritual side of things or just a Western side of things, but you blended these things together and yep. you came up with some principles that you used on yourself, but also principles that are in the book. Uh, can, can you tell me what those big three principles are? Sure, absolutely. Well, first let me tell you about my diagnosis because yeah. I had a really a really unusual diagnosis. Uh, I was giving a keynote address in a conference in Mexico. I called my docs. I had been in for a major checkup. And uh, they said, I said, what's the diagnosis? And he says, well, you should be dead. <laughs> and I, and I said, is, is, that, is that the good news or the bad news? And as a medical anthropologist, I've been in jungles in Africa, in Asia, in Indonesia, in Mexico, in South America. And I picked up parasites and bugs and five kinds of hepatitis along the way. And my brain was compromised. My heart was full of holes. And my liver, they said, you better get in on a liver transplant list. And I went, oh, my God. 
Now, it just happened that the, f the day after my diagnosis, I had a ticket to go to the Amazon jungle together with my wife, who's a shaman. And, um, and in the ceremonies in the Amazon, I managed to get a new liver. The shaman said that, that, that the earth had given me a new liver, an effect you know, I've got a scientific mind. What they had done is they had in, they had intervened to create stem cells in the liver to trigger a repair process. So I relied on Western meds to kill the parasites and the bugs. We're really good at killing stuff, you know, with antibiotics <laughs> and all this. But then I had to repair. My heart was full of holes. My frame, my brain was full of dead bugs, and my liver was gone. Uh, so that's when I used the energy medicine to trigger the production of neural stem cells, of heart stem cells. And today I've got a brand new liver, a brand new heart, a brand new brain, which is led, what led me to write One Spirit Medicine because we all have the capability of doing this. This is programmed into password protected regions in our DNA that we have to hack because we know how to grow, we know how to grow a new body because we grew one. You know, we grew 10 fingers and we grew a liver and a head. We know how to do it. We just got to get back in there, break, you know, hack into that code and switch it on. And, and we got it. So, uh, Alberto, uh, you're, you're a wise person. Like, like you, you've lived an amazing life, uh, a life of learning and knowledge and me meditation and fasting and everything else. Uh, and to hear you say that basically your, your DNA is password protected, you have to hack it. <laughs> uh, I, I love hearing that because it, it's so cool. Uh, and it, how do you hack it though? Like, like <laughs> hearing you say that really just makes me laugh, but uh, what, what's the mechanism for this? Like people listening to this already are going, yeah, right. You've got a really new liver. I'm assuming you've, you've got some, you know, before and after photos of your liver for lack of a better word. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, I, I, I actually do. I got biopsy results before and after, nice. you know, damaged liver, new liver. And uh, I'll tell you how we do it. <clears throat> yeah. What, what's the secret? Well, we can do it in the liver. The liver is, repairs itself very readily. But the brain, you know, when I went to school, we used to think that every shot of tequila we had meant 20,000 brain cells that we killed. And today we know that the brain produces neural stem cells and that products like DHA will do that. And, uh, but I'd like to talk a little bit later about how we're overusing supplements and using some of them incorrectly that will actually damage mitochondrial biogenesis and damage our longevity and our health. But the way that you hack it is you have to first repair and upgrade the brain. You gotta switch off the fight or flight system that all of us are so plugged into that produces adrenaline and cortisol. This is the fear response, you know, run, hide, fight. And then the minute that you switch that system off, you have, which is run by the pituitary gland, it's called the HPA axis. The minute that you switch that off, the pineal gland can start, start a process called methylation. It begins to methylate neurotransmitters. So you methylate serotonin and you end up with mushrooms, with psilocybin mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And the brain loves to get high. You methylate ser serotonin a little bit more, you end up with Ayahuasca. We cannot hack our DNA from our old brain. We have to do it from our higher brain. You can you can use an altered state in, in order to turn off this HPA axis. Uh, in, in my work, I talk about turning off the inner Labrador or turning off fight or flight. There's various ways to do that. And when you it's do that, it's, it's a Doberman. It's really more than <laughs> it's a Doberman, the internal Doberman. Yeah, there you go. Totally. It's, it's that nasty voice in your head that tells you to do bad things like, you know, eat junk food and uh, kill other people. Th that little voice yeah. in your head. <laughs> so, so you you turn that off. And I, I want to talk with you specifically about how you turn that off and maybe how people listening can turn that off. Uh, but then. When you do that, how do you know that your pineal gland is going to actually work? Like, like a lot of people talk about it being calcified yeah. or it can't do it. What, what's the deal there? Well, let me tell you the pathway. I, since we're in the science, we're going to get into the shamanism. And, and, you know, when I was doing my training in the Amazon, I was working with medicine men and women who were saying to me, you've got to bring the jaguar down from the tree. 
And I go, what do you mean? And why would I want to bring it down from the tree? Leave it up the tree. <laughs> yeah. And they, when I decipher what they meant is they, they were trying to tell me that the jaguar is a fear response, the fight or flight. Our jaguar is spooked. It's up a tall tree and we try to bring it down and it's just, you know, gashing at us. And, whoosh, and you got to bring it down so it can do what cats do, which is relax at the base of the tree. But today we're living in such a stressful time that we have a very hard time shutting down the production of adrenaline and cortisol. And that's damaging to the hippocampus, which is where new learning happens. You cannot grow a new body if your hippocampus is damaged. And remember that there's nobody in the planet that's older than seven years old. The oldest person in the planet is seven years. We grow a new body every seven years. And, but to grow a new body that's <clears throat> an improved version of the last one, you have to go into the higher states of consciousness that will allow you to create psychosomatic health. And this is dependent on getting the pineal to switch on the production, tweaking our neurotransmitters ever so slightly to produce these incredible psychedelics that get you into bliss, into joy, and into creativity. In, in, uh, in advanced meditation states that I've been in with the help of neurofeedback, I've actually had more, uh, call them psychedelic visions, than I have on even ayahuasca in, in the rainforest in South America. Uh, um, so certainly we can internally we, produce these things. It just seems like it's really hard for most people who are hearing this. Is there a a little thing you can just tell everyone. <laughs> what, what do you do to feel like you had what do mushrooms you do? when you didn't? What do you, what do you, well, you're not going to get high like with mushrooms because yeah. that's a massive dose. It is. Creative, it's dose dependent. The micro doses really work well to switch on these higher order circuits in the brain. Now, we know your pineal gland is working if you're sleeping well because what the pineal does is that it takes serotonin and turns it into melatonin which is what we need to sleep, but you tweak melatonin a little more and you're entering into the dream state with your eyes open. And this, but this is a random dream-like state. What we want to be able to do is to focus it on creativity and focus it on repairing the body or focus it on repairing your life or discovery. So when you look at how people come across extraordinary discoveries, there's usually a, a, a dream-like process involved where they are able to see opportunity where everybody else is seeing danger or dismal possibilities. So the, uh, these dreamlike states, all right, so let, let's say a good portion of people, maybe 100,000 people are going to hear this upset. <laughs> and Two thirds of them are driving in their car. The other two thirds are probably watching on YouTube or iTunes or, or somewhere on video. So let's say you're well, driving in your car. Like, all right, I'm yeah. interested. Alberto's got my attention. I'm going to read One Spirit Medicine. But what do I do now to turn off this HPA so I can access, say, a better state of creativity? Like, is, is well, there a hack for that? There is a hack for that. And I'll tell you how you know that you need to hack it, that your HPA access is running you. If you're driving and the guy who screams past you is a crazy lunatic that should be put away. And the woman or the guy who's just going at 50 miles an hour in the passing lane, you know, is senile and he shouldn't even be out in the street. <laughs> the minute that you are the sole point of reference in the universe, you know that your HPA axis is, is overactive. You know that your brain is under attack from cortisol and adrenaline. The, you know, the guy speaks by you, you say, have a nice day. That's what I love about LA, you know, when we, when we talk about road rage, we're just kind of connecting with each other, flipping each other off, but, but it passes. <laughs> you know, we don't take it home. The minute that you take your anger or your rage or your resentment with you, and then you know that you've got to upgrade the quality of your HPA axis. And the things that do it are the omega-3 fatty acids, DHA does it, meditation does it, and being out in nature and eating, of course, healthily like you recommend to all your listeners. But omega-3s are essential. So, so I recommend krill oil because it's a phosphorylated omega-3 that your brain can use more and taking omega-3 for your brain is good. But I'm also a little bit wary of excessive omega-3. Like, like there's a couple 
more radical people saying you know, DHA is all you need. And, and that's, in my experience, leads to nosebleeds and, and overuse of, of that. Yeah. What happens, like, like how much do you need and, and how do you make sure it goes into your brain, not just kind of making your cell membranes unstable? Well, I'll tell you, krill oil is fabulous because it's actually mitochondrial fluid. Ordinary <laughs> DHA does, does not get used by yeah, mitochondria. You're correct. So this is, this is a little known secret. I'm glad that you're onto that. And krill oil is magnificent. If you use it for six weeks, that's all you need. Three to five grams for six weeks, you can repair your hippocampus, which is where learning happens, where you're able to tell danger from opportunity. That's a, that's a really quick and readily available fix. The other thing that does it is, is meditation. Now, you don't need to sit and meditate for 20 minutes. It's impossible for most of us. If you can take three deep breaths while you're driving, yep. and, and that's, you know, you're, you're doing a micro meditation, which is going to be resetting your entire system. The, you talked about road rage, and, and I love that you're talking about driving, because I want to know the specific breath you use, and then I'll, I'll ask you about the one I use and see what you think of it. But, but the, the idea of the, the crazy person driving past you, I, I learned, I don't know if it was from you or it might have been uh, from one of my neurofeedback things, but I, I learned to think when, when someone drives past, I could either think you know, they're a, a crazy lunatic, how dare they, or like they probably have like a... Uh, someone having a baby in the back of the car and, and like I should just like let them get to the hospital I have no idea like, like I have zero facts other than there's a fast car so I can fill in the facts however I want it and if I just assume that there's a lot of people having babies in cars I'm generally a calmer nicer person so I'm okay with that <laughs> absolutely is, is that something you, know, you teach? I, what, was that from you well, no, to, totally yeah you okay, know the uh, when I'm with the shamans in the Amazon and in the and the uh in the Andes, they say that you've, you've got to uh, practice not being in the center of the universe. Uh, so that's a really, really good discipline. But the, the other side is that you have to practice fearlessness. And f but to practice fearlessness, you have to no longer be stuck in anger. Because the brain and nervous system resets itself every 20 minutes. And the shamans say, you got to get rid of all your emotions. Emotions are ancient programming, Neanderthal programming. They're not authentic. Feelings are authentic, but feelings don't last. They wash through you. They last for 20 minutes. If, it, if, you're, you, know, if you want to kill, and everybody alive has wanted to kill, because if you've been married or if you have a child, <laughs> you know what it's like to want to kill. But if, but if it lasts for more than 20 minutes, it's not a feeling. If you want to kill your spouse, after a few moments, you go, my God, how could I have felt like that? And it, it passes. If it lingers, it's an emotion. And people that are angry for 20 days or 20 years, you know, they're, 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 their brain is stuck in a Neanderthal survival mode, and they cannot, they cannot step up to the higher brain that will allow them to regrow a new body, to age, to switch on the sirtuin genes, the longevity genes. And instead, they're relying on a pill to do it for them. Uh, which can be counterproductive. Things like curcumin, um, like resveratrol, like um, uh, sulforaphane, that you have to, if you use it continually, will actually have the reverse effect that you intended to use. It's an effect called hormesis, and which is that in certain dosages, you're getting a, a um, the the, the proactive effect that you want and beyond that dose or that period, it does the reverse. It actually inhibits the very, long, the, the very systems that you're trying to upregulate, the longevity, the sirtuins, and, uh, and it'll begin to, uh, to, to do the reverse of what we hope it does. So then for these substances, um, all of which I, I use, and I use them intermittently just because I when I started down the path of using lots of supplements for life extension and to turn my brain back on, uh, I used to you know, fill up a month's supply, you know, like yeah. all the time. and it's always the same every day. And what I do now is I look at my day and I look at my last couple of days and how, how many miles have I flown and whatever else is going on. And then I kind of adjust the stack and sometimes I don't take anything. Some days I take a lot. Well, That's the way to take it. You got to keep the body off guard because if you're taking Western meds, you got to take them every day. If you're taking food supplements, the vitamins and the minerals, you can take them every day. The minute you start taking the upregulators, then you've got to do it intermittently. And three days on, three days off, so you don't get into this hormetic effect where you are actually inhibiting 
the very systems that you're trying to upregulate. Um, that's uh, so. That's your kind of advice: is is three on, three off. Yeah, three on and three off works really well. Three on, four off, so you can time it with your week. But I really want to invite our readers to Google this: hormesis, H O R M E I S E S, hormesis, and particularly mitochondrial hormesis, mm -hmm. because this is the many people that I know are. Uh, using supplements, not foods, but uh, up regulators in a way that's actually inhibiting the very thing they're trying to achieve. One of the things that that made a difference for me was was ozone therapy, and one mm -hmm. of the reasons ozone works is it is a strong oxidant, so it turns yeah. on the body's own antioxidant enzyme systems instead of relying on external antioxidants. But I also take my vitamin C. It's good for me, right? But you, you do yeah. wanna, you don't wanna be aware of that. And taking the same thing all day, every day, I don't think is, is a wise choice. Uh, although I agree. for it's zinc, maybe it is, but. <laughs> yeah, well, well zinc is a, it's a necessary mineral. But yeah. the minute that you're working with, you, with the supplements that, that are tinkering with your DNA, we were talking about how do you hack the DNA. First, you need the higher mind. You need to be able to, uh, to get the big picture of your life. And, and I'll tell you a story. The, um, one time, I, I lead expeditions to the high mountains in the Andes. And one of the expeditions, I was hiking down on my own. I let the trip, the group go ahead of me. And I'm walking down, and I sit on a rock, and I'm at 15,000 feet. And I hear my father's voice. And he says, my, until you realize why you were born my son, you will have to keep living my life and getting sick and die the way I did. And I go, wow. So I come back to the States and I get into therapy. And uh, it was really valuable. I had a really good therapist. And two years later, I'm back in the same mountain, 15,000 feet. And I'm hiking down the mountain again on the same trail on my own, breathless. I sit down to catch my breath and I'm meditating for a little bit, catching my breath, and I hear my father's voice out of the blue. And he says, until you realize why you were born, my son, you will have to keep living my life. And I go, oh my God, I spent two years in therapy because of a punctuation mark. I misplaced the comma. <laughs> until you realize why you were born. What did you come here to do? And this is what this, these higher order neural capabilities give you. What did you come here to do? Not to spend another year in therapy, not to be a, you came here to, you know, to go on an epic adventure. And that's what this old voice was saying to me. Why were you born? So, so that, that's something that I've, I've worked with a, a few clients on it is, you know, what, what's your life's purpose? And uh, the vast yeah. majority of people have no clue. So what's your recommendation for someone who doesn't know what their life's purpose is? How do you find it? Well, uh, you've got to find it. In, you, you can't be looking for it in the places <laughs> you've been looking for all this time. So we try to find it through love or through work, through the other. You know, maybe I'll meet the one. Yeah, I remember a friend of mine calling me, and uh, he was inviting me to his wedding. And it was his fifth wedding. And I said to him, do you remember what you asked me to do to you if you ever thought of getting married again or even looked at a woman? And he said, well, she's different. And so we went out to dinner. She was a brunette version of the last one. <clears throat> Perfectly nice woman. And I said, and he wanted me to perform the ceremony. And I said to him, forget it. I will perform your death rites. I told him, you've got to start, stop looking for the right partner and start working on becoming the right partner. And so when we find ourselves caught in these cyclical behaviors, we know that we're not accessing these extraordinary visionary capabilities that we have innately programmed into us as humans. We're stuck in a predatory behavior, predatory brain of not having enough, of scarcity, of living in fear. And the... Um, and the combination here is clear. We got to work with, uh, with what we eat, what we think, and how we commune with spirit. And, um, and, and we got to do all three of them. All right. So now there's two things that people driving their cars want. One, we still have to finish our question about breaths. And then we have to, we have to tell them, what can you do while you're driving to figure out the reason you're here on Earth? 
<laughs> <laughs> well, you want to do it before you get to your destination, and your destination is really uh, what happens. Uh, what happens when you get to where you're going? So, it's like the caterpillar said to Alice: if you don't know where you're going, just about any road will take you there. So, the um, you know one of the shamanic practices is the practice of truth, where you practice speaking the truth. And this is a really difficult practice because yeah. we all kind of squeak by with these little half truths, and we live in the land of of, of political lies and newspaper. So the practice of speaking the truth, and when you master that practice, then anything you say becomes true because you speak truth and you live truth and you live truly and you don't search for the truth any longer but rather you bring truth to every situation to every encounter to every meeting no matter how deceitful it appears to you you bring truth to it so that's that's the practice if you want to practice that you can take home and start doing right now that practice of impeccable truth is a it's an essential one now, a lot of people are going to say that, that they're being truthful, and then they're going to turn around and say, I need to do this, I have to do that, I can't do that. When you talk about being truthful, none of those is probably a true statement, right? Well, they're, they're, they're partially true. They're relatively true, but they're not absolutely true. And until you get a wake-up call, you get a diagnosis, you get a crash, you, get a, you lose a loved one, and you go, my God, what am I doing with my life? And, um, and why am I doing it? I'm going a thousand miles an hour and getting nowhere. And uh, is this really what success is about? So you begin to ask the big questions. And to do that, to find the answers, um, you have to awaken your higher brain function. And you have to do that through your, as you so really well articulate, you have to do it through your diet and through your practice, your daily practice. Coffee helps. Your coffee is great. I drink it myself. Oh, but it's gotta, I'm honored. It's got to be accompanied by the uh, by the, the practice of impeccable uh, be, impeccable being in this body. You know how many, you know how hard it is to get a body. You know it's incredible. There 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 are thousands of people waiting to incarnate into a body, and we're here on this earth in this amazing amazing journey. And um, and you you choose you choose how you play it. It, it seems a waste to run around at half your capacity. If, if you've got a body, you might as well use it. And uh, that, mm -hmm. that was a mistake that I made younger when I weighed 300 pounds and all that. Is my brain wasn't working very well, and it, it's irritating when you have stuff you want to do. Yeah. Well, the beauty is that you can clear the brain fog. This is what I talk about in One Spirit Medicine. You can clear the brain fog in one week, in three days, actually. It will begin to dissipate. You can begin to grow a new body through what you think and what you eat and what you believe in. And, the, and how you practice uh, truthfulness in your life. Because then you're being true to yourself and to your nature. There's an interesting statistic that I came across that I'm pretty sure I referenced in the Bulletproof Diet book, just from memory. And it's uh, <laughs> that it takes almost two years to replace 50% of your cell membranes. So if, if you start eating the right kinds of fats to build healthy cells that are high performance, it's going to take you a while before you get, like I said, that's seven years to get a, a new body. Mm -hmm. But Precise. if you start three days, your brain starts turning on. And, and certainly that, that's my experience as well. And uh, I'm opening the Bulletproof Coffee Shop because I, I know for everyone who doesn't see the book or, or buys the book and never tries recipes in it, I want to just make one perfect breakfast meal or one lunch or one dinner for someone <laughs> like, whoa, something just yeah. kicked me in the head. And I liked that. And I want more of that. And they can go figure out whatever turns their brain on. But if they've totally. never felt it, it, it seems like a great service just to, to like, just feel it one time. Um, it, is there a yeah. supplement combination or some kind of way that, that you'd recommend for people to feel, you know, to feel really good one time, like the very fastest or biggest thing that you know? <laughs> there, there are a couple of tricks. There are a couple of tricks that you can use. The uh, uh, NADH is one, which yeah. I, you, you know, which it's it really supports the electron transport chain, and you can buy it over the counter. It's amazing stuff. Do you like um, the, a spray or a sublingual? Or how do you take it? I, I like the sublingual. I like the sublingual a lot, and this is actually boosting you without stressing your system out. It's actually improving your performance and the Krebs cycle. Um, now, the amazing thing is that when I, was, when I was in the jungle with the shamans 35 years ago, and they had me eat all these barks and roots, and I would ask them why, they would say it was all because 
because it's always been done this way. And I wanted them to give me the science, which they didn't have. But when, when uh, we took it to the laboratory years later, we found that this is what they had. They basically supported the Krebs cycle. They helped to repair the brain. They had the healthy fats. The, um, and they had the, the super nutrients, the brain nutrients and the superfoods that we know today work. And we can actually get at the local health food store. You don't have to come to the Amazon with me. It, it's interesting that you mentioned NADH. I, I used to take an NADH ATP combination spray, um, which is actually had direct ATP in it. But I haven't taken that in a long time. What I, I do take, though, are things that modify the ratio of NAD plus to NADH, which have a very similar effect. And funny, that would be the unfair advantage mitochondrial stuff, as well as upgraded aging. Like, like two of my core supplements in my daily stack, things that I, I make because they're not around elsewhere. Yeah, it's everything that turns on your mitochondria makes you more of whatever you are, including more of a jerk. If you're a jerk, you, you might want to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> you got to work on that. Yeah, but you know, this is why you want to upgrade the brain as well, because the um, and the mitochondria are essential. For many years, I heard the uh, medicine men and women saying that we had to that the, the feminine life force, the feminine life force was being depleted, exhausted in the planet and. And in each and every one of us, that our, our life force was, was almost non-existent. We were almost shadow beings. And uh, when I asked them carefully what they meant about the life force, he said, well, you inherit it only from your mother, and it's what produces energy in your body. And I go, mitochondria. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what they were talking about. And the, uh, now, the difference is that the shamans didn't have the science. So they didn't know how it worked, but they knew how to use it. So they couldn't tell you that water was H2O, for example, but they knew how to make it rain. And today we have the ability to both. We have the ability to, you know, upgrade our bodies, to grow a new body, to upgrade the brain, upgrade our life, our relationships, and our sense of, of our purpose and meaning here in this life. All of these have to be taken together. Otherwise, you're still looking for the, um, for the, for the magic fix and uh, you know you got to do the exercise you got to do the you got to do the lifestyle changes and what the shamans did that I talk about in one spirit medicine is that they went out on a vision quest they went to have a direct experience of nature and to meet their demons and to and to engage them and to befriend them and to make them their allies and we postponed that. We don't have enough time, enough money, enough, you know, enough sleep. But eventually, at some point, we have to go out to find what that um, guiding vision in each one of our lives is so that we can serve it. So, Alberto, I actually did that somewhere around, I want to say, 2007. I went and I spent four days in a cave outside Sedona, uh, guided by a, mm. a shaman friend who wasn't there, the only human for 10 miles around, uh, with just water and a sleeping bag, basically, and fire. Beautiful. And I, I did it because I figured, like, all right, I'm I'm a former obese person. Like, I had issues with, you know, how comfortable am I being alone? And certainly, it, it, just whatever, emotional issues around food, like, whether they're there. So I'm like, what? better way to push all those buttons at once to, than to be in a cave with yeah. no food and no people, right? Um, totally. and it, it was an interesting, like, it's not what I would have expected. Right? It, was, it was a healing time. But I don't think most people listening to this are going to have the opportunity to do that. Is, is there a, a way to do this in LA? <laughs> like, how, how do we make this more accessible to people to, to help do that? Like, I, I'm very fortunate to have had that experience, but like... No, we, truly, truly. Well, you know, the... <clears throat> You can do it in LA, you can do it in New York City. And in the book, I, in One Spirit Medicine, I talk about clients that I've helped to do their vision quest. One, with, one of them was an ER doc. And he set himself the intention of, uh, of doing a vision quest, which means that you have three days of caloric restriction, basically fasting. And that will switch on all of these repair mechanisms, as you know, that if incredible repair increases free radical production inside the cell, which turns on the free radical scavenging systems in the glutathione, the superoxide dismutase inside the cell. But in the vision quest, you fast and you drink water and you begin to detox. And you said your intention. His intention was to begin to 
find the heart in everyone that he touched. And this was Miami ER, full moon, gunshot wounds that he used to treat like a piece of meat. Now he treated like a living, breathing, future Buddha. And his patients began to get well in a different way. He became a, uh, he became a compassionate human being. And, the, um, and what happened is that his, um, his brain began to change. His relationship to himself, to his family, to his body. And, um, and he found a guiding vision for his life. And before he was into medicine for the money and for the fame and for the fact that it gave him something to do in a very high adrenaline state. And now he became a healer. And, um, and it's, it's a man who, um, who was able to step outside the mold of his own life. So you, could, you can do this wherever you that are. Was, okay. It takes intention, it takes fasting, and it takes commitment to it. And he and took takes, three, days, three days off of work and basically stayed at home, fasted. and No, and, no he, he, he did it while working. He was still, oh, he was still working. That's he was patching, incredible. He was patching people up, but his, his intention was t- to see a Buddha in every one of his patients and not just a bunch of flesh. So he raised the bar. You got to raise the bar. No, that was it. And we can do it wherever we are. We're, we're not too busy because you can do it regardless of what you're doing. You got to raise the bar for yourself. So now at this point, you've probably pissed off some small portion of listeners. The, the, the skeptic minded scientist types are saying like, this isn't crispy enough for me. Like I, I want everything a little bit mechanistic around this stuff, but, but whenever I ask these questions, there's always sort of like, well, there's an intent thing or like there's, there's some fuzziness and every spiritual practice that I'm, I've ever played with or, or experienced or worked with, um, always has some of that where like, like it's hard to explain what it is, but you have to do it or a teacher shows you or uh, something happens. Why is there that fuzzy edge when we talk about these kinds of practices? Well, the, uh, <laughs> we don't have the science behind it yet. We know what fasting does to the body. And we know that one of the things it does is that it makes you really pissed off. <laughs> Anybody that you've ever been pissed off at shows up, your, your anger, your rage, all your unhealed emotions show up. And this is the, uh, and, and your more primitive brain, your Neanderthal limbic brain, it thinks it's going to die because it, that brain feeds on sugars. Yep. And when you fast, you're going basically from the sugar system to the ketones, to, to feeding on fats, which is what the higher brain feeds on. It loves the fats. But when you begin to restrict the sugars from the lower brain and from your intestinal flora, which you have educated into living on chocolate chip cookies and and sugar, they freak out and they begin to put out toxins. They poop. And you begin to put up toxins that that give you mood swings and make you irritable. So it's tough. It's tough tough to do this kind of work, but you've got to make a commitment to yourself to do it. And after three days, you break through. But three days is the mark. And the fussiness about it is because it it deals with feelings, it deals with emotions, it deals with this fussy area that we call spirituality, which in my brain, in my book with David Perlmutter, we try to define really as what happens when you awaken latent neural circuitry and, and begin to live a more enlightened life. Um, but yeah, this, this is, this is fussy territory. We don't have, um, we don't have it under the microscope yet. And it, it makes it rough because people say, I, I, okay, maybe I want to do this. Maybe I'll suspend disbelief. You know, I, I'm an engineer, my background, computer science. I, I come from an engineering family, uh, where I don't think meditation is a, is a common thing. And, and, <clears throat> Uh, the first time I, I tried this sort of thing, it, you, you feel like, like you're not getting results. You don't know what to do. And you talk to this person, they say this, you say this person, you say this. And do you have any sort of, of guidance as someone who's been a long time, you work with clients, uh, you've written 10 books about this. So someone who's open to saying, all right, I, I think it's all BS, but I'm willing as a rational science minded person to do an experiment to see if it's all BS. So I'm gonna this just, is it. Yeah. What, this, do, what this, do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, well you, we are we are the experiment, except this is an n equal one. 
So the, uh, we, if you wait for the research to come out, gravity existed before Newton described it. Uh, you know, we, our microflora has been around before we discovered that our microbiome was really important. And these states of higher perception and higher awareness through which you can create psychosomatic health, through which you can experience extraordinary creativity, they are the experiment. They are the experiment, and they, they take three or four days to do, and they don't, you know, the only thing you need to do is to create a quiet place and set, make a commitment to yourself to go through the program. And if you do, you'll be surprised what you end up with. And this is so, a program that's in, that's in your book or some other this, program? This, or, no, like this, is the, this is the program in One Spirit Medicine, All but right. it's, a very, it's a very ancient program. It was devised by the men and women that discovered curare, in the Amazon, by the first neuroscientist in the um, and among the Native American people that we tend to dismiss as being ignorant because they had no technology, but the um, so this is a very ancient program for upgrading the quality of human existence of the human brain and of your engagement with the world. Uh, I, I I absolutely would recommend that to people who are listening. If if you've never tried anything like this, it's worth a try because what you're going to lose four days. It, it, if you're wrong and or maybe if you're right and you think all this stuff is, is useless. You're, you're going to save a lot of money on restaurants, yeah. you know, in those four days. Yeah. The, the risk is very low to, to trying this. Yeah. And I, I'm reminded of a, a computer engineer, a, a client actually was a programmer, not, not a full on computer engineering guy, a uh, high level Silicon Valley guy. And, I use the heart math uh, training with him. This is a heart rate variability training. And I, I just said, like, I want you to do this 10 minutes a day. So for him, this was the 10 minutes of heart opening mindful meditation, but it was guided by biofeedback. And uh, coming from that world, this is a world of rational people. A lot of them are like kind of on the Asperger spectrum. And this guy certainly was. And, and I get this interesting phone call and he goes, Dave, I, I finally got to the hardest setting on, on this biofeedback. It was really a lot of work. And then I just did it for an hour straight where I was in the hardest mode. I went into this altered state. And he goes, I, I think I experienced bliss. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't hear engineers talk about bliss. Like it doesn't happen. And, and I, I was just so amused at this. But that's the sort of thing you're playing with where maybe it's something you haven't experienced before. But you're talking about a few days of, all right, I'm going to give it a try. So spend disbelief and just do it. So uh, I, I would recommend checking this out. And I've, I've spent a week training you know, with you. you. You know what you're doing. Yeah, my clients, you know, my personal clients include, you know, hedge fund managers, people that manage billions of dollars in the industry, uh, people that are building museums that very, very extraordinarily successful people that um, that uh, have put this to work in their lives. And it is leveraged their uh, inner peace and their outer success. So it works. Um, it's worth a try, and the um, and we have the tools to do it. In the book, I covered the nutritional tools. How do you support mitochondria? Um, how do you support your sleep? How do you go into detox? Because the um, during the night, when you go into a three day fast, you're actually switching into the detox cellular detox systems, what we call autophagy. So you are eliminating cellular waste. Mitochondria are really big structures inside the cell and hard to get through the cell membrane, that what doesn't get recycled. So, the, um, so you're going to be doing a deep scouring, a deep cleansing of the neurons in your brain. And this is what brings about the clearing of the brain fog. And once you do that, once you bring your brain online, wow, you can begin to dream your world into being. Otherwise, you're going to keep repeating the same nightmare that we inherited from our parents and from the culture. It's interesting that, that ketones and autophagy uh, are, are key there. And, and those are some of the, the biohacks uh, that, that I write about as well. And, and there's ways to go very deep a three-day fast. And, and there's the one-day protein fasting where even if you're eating something, you eat zero protein. And you can kick off a certain level of autophagy in, in one day. Uh, because yeah. you still have energy, especially if you're getting enough fat. So you can actually uh, have ketones and you can have some glucose. And so they, all those protein enzymes don't know what to do. So they might as well go to work on cellular repair. And those little things, <clears throat> unless you have a, a practice like a shaman where you're, you're watching and monitoring constantly what your, your brain and body are doing from environmental inputs like 
the forest or like what's on your plate, you're not going to pick this up because it's unlikely you'll find these corner cases. But when you do, there are neat things like the three day fast that you're talking about where suddenly things happen that don't make any sense because they're probably based on principles that we don't fully understand, but they're very tangible. And, you know, someone who said that didn't happen to you because we don't know how it happens would sound like a madman uh, because it did happen to you when you felt it. Yeah, precisely. And, you know, we are the experiment. We are the living experiment. And the context in which this is happening is this amazing event that's happening in the planet right now. Where we're dealing with the sixth great extinction event since the dawn of life in the planet. The, uh, the last great extinction event before the one that we're in was when a giant meteorite struck the Earth 65 million years ago and 95% of all species living, including the dinosaurs, disappeared. But today there are more species being lost annually than in any of the previous five extinction events. And what happens when you have an extinction event like the one we're living in, you know, 70% of all mammals, large mammals, are going to be gone in the next 50 years. This is, this is a science. When you're in the midst of an extinction event, nature steps on the accelerator, takes the foot off of the brake, steps on the accelerator, and then you have tremendous, you have quantum evolution happening. Not just new species appearing, but species that are able to acquire extraordinary uh, mutations and, and become a very adept at what they do. And this is where we have the opportunity to, be, to, to truly make a quantum leap in our own evolution within our generation, uncoil that DNA code another, another turn and develop traits and capabilities that were not available before because it's being supported now by Mother Nature. And in fact, we have to. Can I add something to that, Dave? Please, yeah. Because in the last 50 years, we've undone the last 50,000 years of evolution because we've been saving the lives of children that nature would not have otherwise selected to survive because we've eliminated infant mortality. Infant mortality was 10% 50 years ago. Today is a fraction of that. We're saving the lives of children, including myself, that nature would not have selected to survive. So we've begun to self-select. So we have to begin to participate consciously in creating our health and our longevity and remember that the species, nature selects for the longevity of the species, not of the individual. So that means that nature selects for reproduction at the level of the individual. And I don't want any more kids. <laughs> but, but what happens at, after about the age of 40 is that we begin to switch off the growth hormone, the repair systems in the body. But today we know how to switch them on again. We're drift in the sea of evolution and and it's up to us to create our health. That experiment where N equals one, that's what we're living today. Very, uh, very sage words. Now, we, we never did get to what do you do when, for breathing when you're driving to not want to kill the other drivers? What, what's your breathing hack for driving? Because that's at the very root of all this. You know, stop, stop wanting to kill people and your genes will actually change. So I, what, what's our breathing <laughs> Well, the breathing thing is takes three breaths. It takes three breaths, and you have to do a mantra that goes with it. Okay. This is a very sacred mantra that I'm going to give you. Okay, the mantra is, all I am is my breath. All I am is my breath, all right? All I have is my breath. All I have is my breath. All I have is, you can do either variation okay. of that. All I have is my breath. You in, inhale, in, in inhale through, the, through nose. the nose, exhale through the mouth, and okay. listen to your own breath going in and out. And when you repeat that, that mantra, so because all we have when we're born is our breath, and when we die, that's what's released. We expire. And, um, and that will bring us to appreciate the, the impermanence of our life, the fact that life and death are so intertwined with each other. And that we must appreciate each moment. But when you remember that all you have is your breath, all I have is my breath. Three breaths, mm, it, it resets your perspective. You know, it, it takes you out of, uh, out, of, out of crawling with the hedgehogs to flying with the eagles. Does it matter how long your in breath and out breath are? No, just just deep yogic breath, in breath, 
all I have is my breath out breath and pause for a little bit between the in breath and the out breath. And um, after a while, this will become a, a practice and you'll find yourself doing it 10 times a day. When I, so I, I first did ayahuasca in Peru in about in 2000, uh, which was a pretty profound experience for me. I, I did it with a, a shaman and one of the things that, that I first remember coming out of it all the way is, is taking a breath. But I, I, I felt at the time like I, I had not breathed in a long time. It, and it felt like the first breath I'd ever taken, sort of the, the rebirth mm-hmm. kind of idea. Why is the breath so central to all of the stuff that we're talking about? <laughs> because the breath is, you know, the, um, the region in the brain that regulates breathing is our primitive reptilian brain. And some species don't have breathing programmed into their brain, like dolphins. Dolphins, that's why half of their brain sleeps at any one time, so the other can keep breathing. But the, uh, but the breath, if you look at the word spirit, it means breath. And the, as you inspire, you become inspired, you expire, you die, you exhale. So the, uh, even our story of creation begins in the beginning, there was the breath, there was the word. And when you are able to bring, come back to your breath, you're able to reset that fight or flight system. You're actually instructing the pineal gland to start producing the natural ayahuasca and psilocybin in the brain. The breath is the master regulator. Here's, uh, here's what I do, and I'd love to have your, your shamanic take on uh, this breathing exercise if you have one. Uh, when I'm driving or watching a movie or something, I just generally decide to do something with my breath. I, I breathe in really slowly through the nose for 20 seconds. Hold the breath for 20 seconds and breathe out really slowly for 20 seconds. So it's one breath per minute. And then I hold it empty for I don't know, five seconds because it's kind of. Yeah, that's that. a great practice. Yep. Yeah. Do, do that for 20 seconds in each cycle. Empty for 20, inhale for 20, hold for 20, exhale for 20. And it's, uh, it's a gr- it resets the rhythm of the body, it resets the heart rate, brain waves. It's, it's quite extraordinary. That's a, that's a less than, that's a three minute practice. If you take 20 seconds for each of those steps. And so and it uh, works. I, it I works. do it when I drive and it seems to wake you up and it, but it's also grounding and waking up at the same time. And it's, it's yeah. it doesn't have a mantra. It probably could. The mantra is usually like one, two, three, cause I'm trying to count to 20, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's kind of, well, a, you know, kind of cool you, can look, you can look at the second hand, but if you remember all I have is my breath, all I have, all you have. And then what happens to shamans say that as when you come to the moment of your death, you're able to make your journey back to the, to the world of form consciously because you follow the breath ah all I have is my breath and you return back to your luminous form your luminous nature which is devoid of a body and um, but that's you know that's the obsession of the old medicine people they wanted to learn the journey beyond death and they said that you have to learn it now while you have a body to inhabit and um, because you don't want to be asking for directions when you're making your final crossing so the, um, that meditation, all I have is my breath, then you, you see your, your breath is not just what you hold inside you, but the minute you release it, it becomes one with all of, all of the nature around you. The, the trees are providing you with oxygen. They're taking your carbon dioxide. You're interconnected with all life. You come out of your shell, and the universe is not centered around Alberto anymore. That is uh, that is profound, and just uh, I'm happy to have you on the show to talk about it because it's hard to get to the point of, of this because there's so many uh, so many conflicting ideas and, and people talking about you know there's this dogma that dogma, uh, but what you're talking about here is that n equals one, and, and you can try a practice, and if the practice doesn't have any values or behaviors you have to do about it. It's just you change the way you think about something, and if you like it, you keep it. You don't, you don't. And uh, there's great value in that. Precisely, yeah. And, you know, it's the experiment that we have to do in order to maintain our health and take our health with us into our later years because there's enough of us listening to the show to make up a really big statistical sample. And we know that 29%, according to science, will die of heart disease, 30% of cancer, dementia will hit one out of every two people, 50%. If you live to be 85, you'll have diagnosable Alzheimer's. And that's just a bell curve. 
And only one of us or two of us are going to die in the arms of his or her beloved at the age of 120 after gray sex. And all of us want to be that. Yep. So we got to break out of the bell curve. We got to, we got to stop being a statistic. We got to create psychosomatic health. We got to marshal these resources. They used to be called spirituality, but spirituality really is extraordinary human performance. It's not this mushy, you know, uh, save my ass because I'm not, you know, I'm incapable of saving myself. It's really the awakening of extraordinary capabilities that we all have. It's, uh, it, it's one of those things that I wish I'd picked up when I was much younger uh, because there's, there's so much you can do with it once, once you have the information, once you, you try yeah. stuff. Well, you or, know, the way, I, the way I learned about it is that I, I was 27 and I, I was broke. I was a graduate student and I had a research grant from a large Swiss pharmaceutical that, um, that offered to pay my expenses for three months if I would go into the Amazon and help them discover the next big cancer or dementia or heart disease drug. And, the, um, and I said, well, for what they're offering me for three months, I could live for a year and a half, Swiss francs. So the, I went off into the Amazon into areas that had seldom ever seen a, a white man. And, and the kids would come running up to me and they would rub my skin to see if the, if the white dirt would rub off. <laughs> and the, uh, three months later, I, I came back to Lima, Peru from the Amazon, checked into a hotel, took a nice hot shower. And, um, and they asked me, what did you find? And I said, I didn't find anything because the people that I visited had no Alzheimer's, they had no cancer, they had no heart disease. And if you look at the statistics, even, and this is, you know, there's good science behind this, but even in America in the year 1900, Alzheimer's cases were one in a hundred. They hadn't even been named or discovered yet. Today, they're one out of two, 50% by the age of 85. Autism, one out of 20,000 children. 100 years later, one out of 60. Yeah, Cancer. That, that may be conservative on autism. I'm talking yeah. about with Roy Dittman. It, it's probably on its way to one in 25. It's extraordinary. It's frightening. It's terrifying. So the uh, so what are we going to do? Wait till this one in 10, uh, one in two? So the that experiment of N equals one is becoming really urgent. Because if you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 85, it means that 30 years earlier is when the damage begins. And that's when you have to prevent it. And that's what the shamans were really good at. They were really good at prevention. It, well, where can people find your book? When, when Spirit Medicine, is there a URL you wanted to go to? Because by now, I'm sure that everyone listening is like, I think I want to read this book because it's got science <laughs> and some other stuff in there. So. Yeah, yeah, it's got a lot of good science and it's got the ancient science in it too. And it's going to piss a lot of people off, but that's, that was my intention. I mean, if, if you don't piss at least half of your audience, you're not doing your job. And, the, um, and you know, my agenda is I want to be valuable. I don't necessarily want to be liked, but I, but I want to be valuable. And the um, One Spirit Medicine, you can get it at Amazon or at our website, the4wins.com, the4wins.com, that talks about our energy medicine training programs. Um, or you can go to onespiritmedicine.com, and there's all the sciences there. And the science is now supporting what uh, medicine men and women discovered 10,000 years ago when they had the paleolithic, paleolithic diet and the paleolithic belief systems. Well, there's a, there's a question, Alberto, that I've asked every guest, including you when you were on the show last time, <laughs> which is, you know, what, what are your top three recommendations for people who, who want to perform better? So I'm going to change the question for you and, and ask you, given all of this knowledge you have, what are your top three recommendations for people who want to discover their inner healer? You want to do to your body what you've done to yours. What are your top three most important things? Uh, first, you've got to be able to laugh at yourself at least five times a day, regularly. Laugh at yourself and, it, uh, and, and, and really cultivate the humor. Second, uh, practice, practice kindness. Practice kindness and compassion, beginning with yourself. The, um, and, and let me elaborate on this one. This has to do with the practice of non-suffering. Because pain is inevitable. It's part of life. Suffering is optional. 
So practice non-suffering. Practice compassion with yourself and others. And the third thing is that you, you, you know, it's what Armand Hammer, Hammer said. He said that if he had known he was going to live this long, he would have taken better care of himself. You got a body, you know, work it out, exercise it, feed it right, and, um, and be blissful, you know, practice bliss. And this is what we came here to do. We came here to dream the world into being and not to trudge and suffer through life. And we know how to do it. One spirit medicine is a small contribution to that. I love what you're doing, Dave, because that's, that's your mission and your vision. Uh, thanks, Alberto. Uh, that, that means uh, something extra special coming from you because I, uh, I really value your teaching uh, and your wisdom. And thank you for being on Bulletproof Radio. Thank you so much. Hey, if you liked today's episode, and I certainly did, this was a great interview, uh, please do me a favor, head out there and pick up a copy of Alberto's book. That would be incredible. It'll be good for you, and it'll be good for him, and uh, it'd be good for me, actually, because I'd love to see that happen. I really want Alberto's work to hit the New York Times because it's going to help a lot of people, and that's what Bulletproof's all about. While you're at it, uh, head on over to iTunes, click like or thumbs up or whatever it is you click on iTunes to say that this was a good episode. I always appreciate that, too. Have an awesome day. Mm -hmm.